Joining us now to discuss the economic impact of America's dropout problem and the effect it has on our nation's competitiveness is Cecilia Rouse. Ms. Rouse is a professor of economics and public affairs at Princeton University. She's also a senior editor of the policy publication, The Future of Children, and served on the President's Council of Economic Advisors. Welcome to Need to Know, Cecilia. Thank you. Can you give us some specific examples of how the dropout crisis actually makes us less competitive? Well, I think it's in, in two ways. One is that um, if we have somebody who is potentially productive, who can't, doesn't have just the right kinds of skills or has never learned to read or you know, do math at the level that one we expect of an 18, 19, 20 year old, uh, then they're not gonna be able to contribute what they could potentially contribute. So that's one way in which it's not gonna help us be productive if we have a lot of individuals who are not employable. The second side is that we, we have to support them. And so what it means is for all those individuals who are employed, Part of their paycheck is going to pay for their families, but part of their paycheck is going to support those individuals who don't have the right skills and so are not employable. So it, it, it means it's, it's just an extra burden on society as a whole. Whereas I think if we just took a dollar and invested it in that individual today, to help them develop the skills through high school, we would get back, you know, our estimates are like between $1.45 and $3.55 over the lifetime um, in terms of their return, in terms of their increased tax revenues that they're able to contribute by having a job, and the, the fact that they're less likely to commit crimes, uh, will less likely to be on public assistance, are gonna be healthier. So what would be some examples that if we were to turn around the high school dropout crisis, um, that would actually show that the economy could then grow? If you have individuals that are skilled and know how to problem solve, they're also gonna be innovators. And so they can help think of what is the next innovation? What's the next new iPad that's gonna come down the pike? Now, obviously, we have lots of innovators that didn't get their creative ideas through our educational system, but I would challenge you that many of those innovators had learned the kinds of problem-solving skills uh, through their educational system that allowed them to be creative and think of and to put the dots together in a new way. We also know we, we need entrepreneurs. And, you know, to start a small business, uh, you know, you have to be creative and have the gumption to do it, but you also have to learn to do accounting and to keep track of your, your bookkeeping um, and to understand how to manage your, your business so that it can succeed as well. And so you need to develop those skills and, and our educational system is a natural place for that to happen. So if you were devising a program to, to combat uh, dropouts, what would be the three specific things that you would say, here's what we really need to do. These are the three things we need to tackle first. If I was going to be focusing a program on dropout prevention, first of all, I, I probably would invest more in terms of our pre-K and early elementary school years. I, I do believe that students develop especially reading skills, if you don't develop those reading skills early on and we know that you need them to succeed later, I think it's so much harder to catch up. The second thing I do is I would worry a lot about middle school, especially that eighth grade to ninth grade transition. We know we lose a lot of students in the transition from middle school to high schools. And I think that what we need there is a lot of mentorship and uh, an adult that the individual, that the students can talk to and help guide them. And lastly, I would ensure that the curriculum is is really rigorous. I think it's not that I think that we need to ha make sure that everybody can do calculus by 10th grade, but I do believe we have to raise our standards and have high expectations. And it's not so that everybody can go to college, but that so everybody is, you know, the, now what we're all saying is college or career ready. And I take the career part very seriously because when you talk to employers, they say students and and, and job applicants, uh, they can't read, they can't do basic math, they can't in engage with customers in a sensible way. They don't have the just the executive functioning kinds of skills to really be able to function in today's workplace. So what would be those specific skills, for example, that high school kids would need to have? So I think this, the skills at a very high level, one thing that we know is happening in our economy is that, you know, if you think about what computers and machines can do, they can do any kind of job that can be routinized. So what that means is that we people, we human beings, need to be able to take advantage of what we can do that the machines can't do, which is the non-routine types of skills. So we need, that our, we need for our students to be able to problem solve. We need for them to be able to recognize when something's not quite right and to use their creativity to figure out how to solve that problem. It feels like at that point you actually have to work a lot with the teachers to teach this because that's not 
in an easy curriculum. Absolutely, and that's where I think many people have argued that our curriculum is stuck back in the 1950s and 1960s, and that everybody soup to nuts needs to be thinking about, well, what, do, what are the skills that we really need to be teaching our students going forward? Is there the will, though? I mean, what you're talking about is really changing things soup to nuts. Um, really, the political will, the dollars, the, the massive resources, does it really exist? Well, I always I like to think that necessity is the mother of invention, and I think that the economic times call for will just it, demand it. So we all are going to have to learn to do more with what we have, and so you I, I do believe that with that we will be forced to be more creative. I can tell you that the federal government is already looking for ways to do just that by helping cities and localities take the various federal money, money that's available and make better use of it and leverage it. Uh, a lot of cities, not just school districts, you know, have money, but they themselves don't know how to coordinate funds, just like I think many school districts don't. And so I think that is where a lot of the next wave will be in terms of, you know, how do we do more with what we already have? I'm sure that there are people who are saying, you know what? We had President George W. Bush, who focused on No Child Left Behind, said that he was focused on education. We have you know, four years of President Obama also saying that wants to focus on education, pointing you, for example, to work on this. But there are a lot of people who are saying, but nothing is changing. So one thing that I would like to say that um, did also happen under President Bush's administration, which I think doesn't get enough credit, is he also started the Institute for Education Scientists. And he also said we need to bring much more rigor to education research so that we really do understand what works and what doesn't work in a rigorous way. And President Obama has elevated that to even the next level. Using Recovery Act funds, he started the Investing in Innovation in Funds in Education, which is funding lots of very exciting research in education. So I actually think we're learning more about what works, and we're learning not only what works at the small scale, but how to bring it to scale. And how do we ensure that really solid programs that show effectiveness can, be, can work in many different settings? All right, well, a lot to think about. Thank you for joining us on Need to Know, Cecilia Rouse. Thank you very much for having me.